morning, everyone. You can remain seated as we sing together, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens, there's shown a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. That Jesus Christ is born Down in a lowly manger The humble Christ was born And God sent us salvation That blessed Christmas morn Go till it on the mountain Christ is born. We sing and go till it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go till it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. That Jesus Christ is born. That Jesus Christ is born. Hello everyone, good morning. It's been, it was a very cold morning. <laughs> very, very cold. My fingers were like not moving when I got up this morning. But I'm glad I'm here and it's a little bit warm in here. And I hope you guys are keeping warm. Amen. And so you are very, very welcome to Broadway Baptist Church. This is a place where you come in and the doors are always wide open. You have these wonderful people at the door uh, welcoming you and wanting and doing everything to make you feel at home and make you feel happy when you come in here. And, we, and that is truly what Broadway is about. Broadway Baptist Church is about you coming in here and truly feeling at home, feeling blessed, feeling loved. And come in with an open heart, an open spirit, ready to receive God's word, to learn and to grow. That is what Broadway is about. And I cannot be, thank be thankful enough that I and my family, we are part of Broadway. Amen? Pastor Daniel has just been wonderful. I mean, like, a leader who is so selfless, he never does anything for self-aggrandizement. He just leads. He just pastors. He just opens God's word. He just preaches from it. He just allows, gives everyone that opportunity, that privilege to express themselves. He is just such a blessing, such a selfless leader, and I am just so blessed that I can sit under his leadership in this church. And I don't know how blessed you are with what he has been doing here, him and his family, but if you are as blessed as I am, and I 
our family is, you want to give it up, give it up for Pastor Daniel with a standing ovation. Can you just give a big hand clap to Pastor Daniel? He has been wonderful, and I know he has been to you as well, and I believe it. Amen. And Pastor Daniel, thank you so much for all what you have been doing in this church. We are so blessed having you. I know you don't like this, but we couldn't help doing it. <laughs> Amen. And so if you are here for your very first time, and you, you, or you have been here, and it's been a while, please do well to fill in those connection cards at the back of our bulletins and we will try as a church to connect with you to get to know you better to to make you truly feel at home we truly want to do that so try to put in your information and drop it at the back at the welcome center and the church will be able to connect with you uh, when that time comes amen and so don't leave this place without making us know you better. Amen? And so I want you to enjoy this worship service and just be blessed this morning. Praise the Lord. And I'll turn it back to Brother Beecher. We'll give you a little background music. If you want to stand and just welcome your neighbor for a few seconds. Remain standing to sing together. I felt herald angels sing glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God has sent His reconciled. Joy. Yeah. 
joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more that sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders, wonders of His love. To joy to the world again. And joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him a room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature's sing. We'll move forward with our offering this morning. So if our ushers can come on up. Brother George is going to say a prayer for us. Dear Father God, in uh, Matthew 23, 23, you uh, say woe to those who... Uh, just tithe just to uh, be um, doers of the law. They, they tithe, on, tithe on mint and cumin, and they disrespect your laws, your moral laws. Father God, I pray that as we're New Testament believers and we give out of the generosity of our heart and to uh, help the widows and the poor, I pray that you would just uh, be with us this Christmas time and that we would just enjoy giving out of our hearts. In your name we pray. Oh, come, oh, ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come, ye to Bethlehem. Oh, sing 
God, we thank you so much that you sent your son here to be born into this world, to live a perfect life, and then to be crucified on the cross and resurrected. We celebrate that life during this season, that birth. We thank you so much uh, that we have a wonderful church that is uh, giving, and we have a pastor who's uh, just a great leader and selfless. We just pray that as he comes this morning that you bless him uh, with the words he has to share and just thank you for the opportunities you give us to to reach out to others and to to share your word with others and to give with others and let us have our eyes open at all times to those things in Jesus name amen thank you so much Beecher thank you for that we're going to go into our time before the children go downstairs for children's church I'm going to invite the Ketty family so uh, innocent you and your family are going to come on up and we are going to light the candles. Now, I'm going to explain the candles because today we're lighting our fourth candle for the Advent. Now, remember, our first candle here is this one right here. This here represents hope because the word Advent means coming. So we're getting ready for the coming of Jesus. That's the first candle. The second candle here, it means faith. We're placing our faith in the coming Christ who's coming. Last Sunday is the pink candle, which represents joy. Joy is the excitement of Christmas. And then today, our last candle, the, the Sunday before Christmas, that is what we call the peace candle because the Bible tells us that Jesus brings peace to this earth. And then on Christmas Day, we'll write the Christmas candle here. So I'm going to give this, and I'm going to let you pick each one of y'all, Innocent and Ketty and your fam- and uh, Karine and your family can light one of these with, along with this. So y'all can each uh, pass that and light a candle. So this one would be the first candle we write right here. That there is our hope candle. All right, Fortune. All right, so this here now is our faith candle. Karina, you can light the joy candle. That's the pink one. And then, Ketty, you can light today's candle, which is the peace candle. 
were telling the story of Jesus coming. Years and years ago, this centuries ago, this is what these candles, folks would tell the Christmas story of Advent, of the coming of Christ. So, so that is, so thank you so much. So I, I appreciate y'all lighting our, our candles today. So, all right, Miss Osborne, you are leading Children's Church. So Miss Sherry, you want to stand up? If you're a little person right now, you want to follow Miss Osmond, and there you're going to follow her through about third grade, and you're going to go downstairs to Children's Church. And then, parents, you will pick up your children afterwards downstairs for Children's Church. Any other children? I want to go to Children's Church. All right. For those of us upstairs, you want to open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This will be the Christmas story. This is a message here on what we would call uh, looking at Christmas through the lens of Joseph. Joseph is the stepfather of Jesus. Jesus' mother was Mary. Jesus... Was he had, his father was actually God the Father in heaven. Mary was a virgin, and she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. God made Mary pregnant, but Mary was engaged at that time to Joseph. So, obviously, when you are engaged and you find out that your fiancé is expecting a baby, and you've never had relations with her, you naturally think, well, this is not the woman, this is not the girl whom I thought I was marrying. There was a deep disappointment. And what we see here is we're going to see how God actually spoke to Joseph and led Joseph during this time. And it's important for us because Joseph, the Bible never records Joseph saying a single word. So he's a quiet man. At least he's a quiet man in the Scriptures. He could, he could have been a real talker, but no words are recorded by Joseph. But Joseph is one that is led and guided by the Holy Spirit. And the goal of this message, this sermon today, is our example of Joseph, of how having knowledge and knowing things, even when we see things that would make sense to us, like you're engaged to a young lady and then she's pregnant, you're thinking, okay, She's telling me that God's the Father, and Joseph just didn't believe that. I said, Mary, that's never happened, and I'm sorry, I don't, I don't believe you. So he wanted to divorce her, do away with her, and God got involved. And Joseph's strength, what we see from him, is that he believed God. He actually took action, and he, this, the Christmas story, in many ways, is one of Joseph acting on that belief. And we're going to see that today. And I mentioned about knowledge. Knowledge is not a challenge for us. Do you know, I was reading the news this week, and there is something called artificial intelligence. And there's a, there's a website you can go to called openai.com or .org. Artificial intelligence. And I just, you know, I just wanted to check it out. What is this stuff? I go to this website, and this is true. Don't do it now, though. You can do it when you get home. You can go on this website, and let's just say I was a fifth grader, and I was supposed to write a book report on the fourth chapter of Shakespeare's Hamlet. And I don't really know how to read Shakespearean literature, but I've got to do my work at school. And it has to be seven bullet points on summarizing the fourth chapter. You can go type in this website on openai.org and say give me a seven point bullet point summary of Shakespeare's Hamlet's fourth chapter on a fifth grade reading level and then all of a sudden you hit enter and it starts coming out and they, there's my there's my homework right there and you can copy and paste it and there's your work did y'all know that's available let's just say your car breaks down and your radiator is overheating, and you're thinking, I, don't, I, don't, I need to fix it myself, because I don't have the money and time to drop it off at the shop. I need to be able to drive my car. You can type in there, fix my radiator, 
on my 2010 Mazda 5 while it's raining outside. So it might be a rainy day. And it will actually tell you how to fix your car. And, and what this is, this is a massive knowledge database. I mean, it's just facts. I mean, I don't know if it's all facts. It's just stuff that comes out. What I saw looked pretty good. I'm sure there's some, a lot of mistakes in it. But it's just mass quantities of knowledge. And I think what we're going to see here in this passage today, our challenge today is not knowledge. It's not knowing stuff. If you want to know something, you, anything, you can get anything you want on the Internet, literally anything. The challenge for us is actually what Joseph has to do here, and that's acting and obeying the Lord. You can know it, all sorts of stuff. You can know the Bible frontwards to backwards. The Pharisees knew their Bible phenomenally well. They just didn't believe it. They didn't act on it. It did not impact or change their life. And we're going to see the story here of how Joseph, he was changed by the Lord, and he actually took action on it. So that's our scripture we're going to look here in Matthew chapter 1. And then a little bit in this message, we're going to flip over our Bibles, and we're going to look at the book of, of, of John, John chapter 14. So we're going to be in Matthew 1, John chapter 14. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother, Mary, had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. You know, what a disappointment for Joseph. You, know, you think about this. He's planning his wedding, and now she's expecting. And one of the great things, what, you know, they both were from this little town in northern Israel called Nazareth. But they had to travel down to Bethlehem because that's where the census was for. The census was important because they needed to make sure they had a count so they could get taxed. That was like your annual IRS payment that you would make in, in April. So that's what they're doing right here. They're, they, they are, they're expecting a baby, but then they have to travel to Bethlehem. So I imagine when they went down to Bethlehem, and baby Jesus is born in a manger, they probably wanted to stay there as long as they could because they really didn't want to go back home because their family knew Joseph wasn't faithful to Mary. They didn't wait to have relations before they were married. Or Mary was just unfaithful with someone else. So it probably put Joseph in an awkward position. Here he is, engaged, and his wife's now expecting. So they probably wanted to stay away from Nazareth as long as they could. That's why they took, you know, God led them also not only to Bethlehem, but also led them over to Egypt. So it was very easy for them to stay away because they're, they're from a small town. People are going to be talking. Folks are going to know, hey, we know about Joseph. So there was this deep disappointment initially for Joseph finding out his fiance is expecting a baby. And the Bible goes on to tell us here, so her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. Joseph was one of these guys. He didn't want to talk about it on Facebook. He didn't want to make a big scene. He wanted to do the quiet breakup. He was like, look, Mary, look, you go your way. I'll go my way, and we'll just pretend this never happened. Say, we'll just won't talk about it. I won't shame you. I won't talk bad about you. We're just going to part ways and... We just pretend nobody knows anything about this anymore. I have no idea who Mary is anymore. That was a kind of, he had decided that was his plan. And it says he had made up his mind. And it says here in verse 20, But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So Joseph had made his decision, and he was not going to change. Do you know a lot of times when people make up their mind, when people decide something, they do not change. I was watching one time this attorney on TV. He was a trial lawyer, and he was talking about how to win cases in court. And he says, and you would probably think the answer would be, is it the opening and the closing argument? Would that win a court case? Is it the evidence you show? Not at all. He says, that might be a little important but that doesn't whatsoever win a court case if you want to win a trial a trial case it's all about jury selection 
jury selection is the most important part for a trial attorney to win a court case. And he said the reason why is because there are many people, maybe you're one, that you've already decided in your mind what you believe about an issue. And you're not going to change. And it doesn't even matter. Even if the evidence is right there in front of you, you refuse to change. You know, this is what Jesus dealt with the Pharisees. It doesn't matter what some folks say. You're just, your mind is made up. This is what you believe. This is how you're going to vote. This is what you're going to do. Well, in this case, Joseph, he had made up his mind. And the Lord got involved. He thought, we've got to change this man's mind. He went to bed, and he was going to leave Mary. And he woke up, and he's going to be a changed man. And so how does God speak to us today? You know, I do believe God speaks to us today through dreams. But we have to be careful of that, because sometimes your dreams might not line up with what Scripture says. But here, 2,000 years ago, the Lord is using dreams to speak to Joseph. For us today, I believe the primary way, at least the Lord speaks to me, is through reading God's Word. If you have a daily time you spend with reading your Bible, God is going to speak to you through these 66 books of the Bible. Folks, you need to have a prayer life. That's the other way. If you're praying to God, asking Him to reveal reveal His will and purpose to you, He speaks to you through that prayer life. If you don't know what to pray, you can pray the Scriptures. He will speak to you through that through those scriptures not only that god also speaks to us when we come to church you're among fellow brothers and sisters in christ you're coming to a worship service you're going to sunday school and you will hear what the lord has a message for you so we look at the different areas of how god might speak to us today through reading the bible through our prayer life through church attendance here at broadway But in Bible times, back 2,000 years ago, in this situation, God chose to use dreams. He is speaking to Joseph in the middle of the night while no one one else is even aware of it. And he's saying, Joseph, this is not what you think. And it goes on to say there, verse 21, She will give birth to a son, and you're to name him Jesus, because... He will save his people from their sins. That is the messianic message of what Jesus will do. He's coming into the world with the purpose, the mission of actually saving the people. We're seeing Jesus, what he's going to do long before he's even born. He came into the world through Mary, born in a manger, born in a barn, as a savior now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the lord through the prophet see the virgin this is a quote from isaiah 7 14 see the virgin will become pregnant and will give birth to a son and they will name him emmanuel which is translated god with us that is the name of jesus god with us jesus is and when we come at christmas time and we're singing about emmanuel We are honoring and singing about baby Jesus. He is the one who is with us. When Joseph woke up, verse 24, so all of a sudden this dream is, even in the dream, God is quoting scripture to to Joseph. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. And he named him Jesus. And that is the obedience of Joseph. Do you know in Joseph, we don't see him again until after the Christmas story. You know, they, they took him to baby dedication and Jesus was dedicated. And the next time we see Joseph was when Jesus and Mary, or and Joseph, all three of them, went to church when he was 12 years old for Passover and Jesus got lost. And he got left at church. Guess if you're going to get lost, getting lost at church is a good place. After he got lost, that was the last we see of Joseph in the scriptures. No other mention of him. We don't see him doing anything else. He's at the Jesus' birth. We know Joseph was a carpenter, so he likely trained his son, Jesus, how to be a carpenter. He was a descendant of David, and you can see that quote when that angel addressed him. He said, Joseph, son of David, he's reminding him, you are in the lineage. You know the Messiah is supposed to come, 
from the lineage that you're from the your bloodline. Now there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who were from that lineage of David. So obviously he didn't know if he was going to be the one. And Mary's from that lineage as well, from descendants of data of David. So what happens here is is God selected this man, reminded him about the promise of old, saying from David the Messiah is going to come, and Joseph, you're the family. Mary's the one. You're going to be his stepfather. And Joseph, we see a picture of this man who obeyed the Lord. That is what he's known for. He's not known for uh, doing anything really special, but the most special thing is his obedience to God. And folks, that's the life I think we need to be living as well. You know, during Christmas time, it's a busy time, but God wants us to make sure we are, 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 are obeying Him. I mean, you think about, how do we obey the Lord today? Here we are in 2022, and you're wondering, what can we do to be obey, obeying the Lord? Like I mentioned earlier, daily reading the Bible. You know, we're starting off next year. I hope you've picked up your Bible in our Welcome Center. We are beginning in two weeks on January 1st. We're going to be reading the Bible together through the Chronological Study Bible. And when you read through that Bible, every day you're systematically following what and God will speak to you in those passages. Getting on a Bible reading plan is a great way to do it. Junior and I, we're, we're, we're members of this gym. It's a 24-hour gym on Boston Road called like Anytime Fitness. And you can go there at 3 a.m. if you want to. But if you go there right now, if you were to go after church, you could go on an elliptical machine, and there'll be lots of them available. Lots available. We know the owner of the little, little place, and he says, Dean, I want you to know something. In January and February, you won't be able to get one of these elliptical machines. And that is true. Right now, the place is empty. It's December. But if about January 1st or January 2nd, if you show up at a gym, do you know what you find? You, it's packed, overflowing with people at the gym. There's, there's no room whatsoever. And that lasts till about end of February. By March, it will be back to normal. They make all their money at the gym the first two months. I mean, you, if, you open, if you own a gym, you just know you're busy season. You just need to hire employees for only two months. Because once March comes, everybody's gone. And I think a lot of times that's how, because folks make obviously New Year's resolutions for the new year that they're going to get in shape and go work out and do this, that, and the other. And they do for about six or eight weeks. And then it's over with. And then they're still building your credit card in March, April, May. You don't even go there anymore. That's, that's, how they, that's how they make their money there. But what happens, I think, for us, folks, our Bible reading plan is the same way, our commitment to the Lord. You make a commitment here at Christmas time or the first of the year, and folks, by March, April, Easter time, that commitment has waned. And I think the accountability for you, this, this new year, our theme is Year of the Bible. You read that Bible. An entire church reads it together, and it's dated for each day. And you can go through the Bible in all of 2023. I mean, answer the question. You're a believer in Christ. Have you ever read the entire Bible? Ever read the entire Bible? Well, here is an opportunity to do so. You can stand before God when you give an account for your life. Say, Lord, I read every verse. I read every, every, every book in your, the book that you, revealed, you gave us. So that is, that's what obedience to God looks like. Throughout, throughout the year, you're making that commitment. You're setting that time with Him. Not, that, not only do we... Our daily quiet time, our daily devotional time, we honor the Lord like Joseph did in our daily decisions. Every day we choose, God, am I going to actually live out what your word says? Am I going to take action on what you want me to do? This week is Christmas week. You will see people in your family, friends who do not know the Lord. They're not saved. And you will have an opportunity to talk to them about, about their relationship with God. Last night, Sherry's, she works at the VA. She had her VA Christmas company party. I had to go to it. I was her date. So I go to it. And, I, and a lot of the folks, maybe they don't go to church. They don't know the Lord. I use my conversations. I don't want to be obnoxious about it. But I try to use those conversations to talk about the Lord. Somehow invite these folks to church. Let them know they need Jesus. Because I'm among a group of people that I normally speak to. 
I'm a stranger, I'm talking to strangers, and you want to use that chance at these uh, unusual settings to talk about the Lord. We honor the Lord. Joseph woke up, it says. He woke up, and he did what the Lord wanted him to do. And folks, I think God's speaking to us, some of you, the same way. What, what is God wanting you to do? God does not save us so we can watch World Cup soccer, so we can watch TV, and so we can watch movies all the time. That's just not the Christian life. We don't see men and women of faith in the Bible who just wasted their days. They used their time for the Lord. They lived a life just like, just like Joseph of one of obedience. So what's happening here is whether it's going to work, going to school, feeding your family, paying your bills, it's that mundane life of just going through the daily grind, yet using that time of honoring God. There was nothing special about Joseph and Mary. God just chose them. They were a young couple engaged. They loved the Lord. They loved Jesus. But they were obedient. And folks, they're an example for us. They weren't divine. They weren't angels. They didn't have any superhero powers. These were just people like us who loved the Lord, whom God chose to send His Son into, into the world. And God took this young, holy family because they had a love for the Lord. And I think the days for us is we have to make sure that we see the example here of when God makes it clear what we need to do. And we say, what do we do? The Bible tells us here about Jesus. His purpose was to save the people from their sins. That's what verse 21 tells us. That means God's great purpose with Jesus is all these lost people that live here in Lexington. Folks, He wants them saved. That's the greatest need they have. Folks need to know the Lord. Now flip over here in your Bible to the book of John. John chapter 14. Many of us here, uh, we, we, we talk about what it means to know Christ. And what's interesting, the word Holy Spirit in that passage was actually used back in Matthew chapter 1. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. When we come to church and we talk about our salvation experience and we call people to come to Christ, I always say you need to come to Christ. You need to make a decision to follow Jesus. You want to ask Jesus in your heart. So we know Jesus here, he was born in a manger. He died on a cross. He is in heaven right now. So when you get saved, what actually happens? The Bible tells us the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who uh, made, who got Mary pregnant, actually comes inside of our hearts and saves us. He seals us for eternity. And I'm going to show you that here. This is the gr one of the great teachings of what we see from Jesus. Because Jesus came, he taught. Now look what he says here. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Folks, that's how we show our love for God. Joseph showed his love for the Lord just by doing what the Lord said to do. Folks, you can show your love for the Lord by just in the, the daily routine of your life reveals your love for God. And I, Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. The word counselor is another name for God. The Holy Spirit is a counsel. If you need a counselor, if you need some counsel, the best counsel is to go to God. You go directly to your creator, directly to the author of life and the giver of life, and he will provide you with counsel. And this counselor says he is to be with you forever. Forever. That means we do not lose the Holy Spirit. He comes inside of us and he provides us with that counsel. You know, that really raises the question, can someone lose their salvation? And the answer is no. Because of this Bible verse, it's saying he's with you forever. You don't lose the Holy Spirit. You say, well, what about if somebody was saved maybe as a young man, a young woman, but then they all of a sudden they drifted out of church and they're no longer living for Jesus. Back in the old days, you might remember preachers would preach sermons on being a backslidden Christian. Or in the Baptist church, a backslidden Baptist. And what they're talking about 
is that is somebody who is saved, who knows the Lord, but because of disobedience and getting out of godly habits and making wrongful, sinful decisions, all of a sudden, they need to repent and turn back to the Lord. Well, a good example of a backslidden Christian in the Bible is Thomas. Thomas doubted Jesus was resurrected. When the people came to him, the other disciples, and said, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. He looked at them and says, no, you didn't. I don't believe you. Until I see the nails in his hand and on his side, I will not believe. He had gone back to his old way of life. Jesus walked in the door a few days later. He turned straight to Thomas and said, Thomas. I mean, he didn't care about the other face. Thomas, look at my hands. Look at my side. Stop doubting and believe. When he says that word, stop doubting, that's what backslidden Christians do. They're doubting God's power. They're doubting God in their life. They have allowed other things to come into their life and, and cast doubt upon their belief. Because if they were not doubting, they would be living the way. Folks, when the Bible tells us that the Counselor will be with us forever, we cling to these words. We believe it. God never leaves us. We live for Him daily. And look what this verse keeps going here. Last Bible verse of this morning. He is the Spirit of truth. Truth comes from God. God is the author and creator of truth. So the Holy Spirit comes and teaches us what is truth. And I want to tell you, that's where we need to learn truth from. You won't necessarily always learn truth at school. And you won't learn it certainly on TV. If you want to learn truth, you learn it from the Lord. God teaches us truth. Do you remember how the devil was described by Jesus? Jesus called the devil the father of lies. And he says when he speaks, referring to the devil, he speaks his native tongue. Remember when uh, the serpent, the ancient serpent, tempted Eve? What did he do to her? He lied to her. The devil is a liar. So anytime we lie, we are actually lining up. When we're dishonest, we're lining up with the devil. Honesty, truth, these are characteristics of the Lord. We guard truth in our life. We live for truth. Do you know that neat thing is, science, as Christians, do you all know science and biology are actually our friends? Because if you can, if physics, science, and biology, folks, that stuff doesn't change. It does not change. Bi biology, is best. this is how the Lord made it. This is biology. It does not change in, in the world. Physics does not change. This is, these are facts. It will always be a fact here in this earth. And we as Christians, we cling to those truths because God creates truth. He says it right here, I am truth. And it says the world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. That means there's a lot of people who today, they do not know the Lord because they just refuse to believe. Or they change the truth. My wonderful wife loves Tostado's potato chips. So she sends me to Kroger this week to buy her potato chips. I go there, and I'm looking at the chip aisle, and she wants these Christmas chips. There are potato chips, it's all at Kroger, that are shaped like Christmas trees. I pick up the bag, it's on sale, luckily. I guess because we're getting close to Christmas. Now Christmas stuff's starting to go and sell. I'm buying this stuff. I'm looking at the bag. Oh, my goodness. They called the bag of chips Tostado, Tostado's holiday trees. Not Christmas trees. Holiday trees. I go, how sad. But it looks like a Christmas tree. I go, how sad. Even the potato chip company won't even call a Christmas tree a Christmas tree. And do you all know why Tostado's won't do that? Because they don't want to use the word Christmas. That's what that's all about. They would rather use the word holiday because it doesn't, holiday will never offend anyone. It's the most vague word in the world. Even your chips aren't even, they don't even use the word Christmas in that. Because the word Christ, the reason for Christmas, and the truth that you cannot get around this here. Because the Bible just told us here, He is truth. The Holy Spirit teaches truth. Why do we have Christmas? What will the whole world be celebrating? 
Next Sunday, on the 25th of December, they'll be celebrating the baby that was born in a manger in Bethlehem. Folks, it's not about Santa Claus. It's not about gift giving. It's not about work parties and whatever else people do. Folks, the reason for this event next Sunday is Jesus. It's Christmas. And that what happens is we as Christians, we have to be aware that instead of a Christmas tree, holiday trees will creep into your life. And you, you and I as believers, we have to be ever more aware of what's happening around us. Because the Bible says here in verse, in verse 17, they are unable to receive him because they don't see him or they don't know him. People who do not know the Lord do not want to hear about Jesus. They do not want to hear about the baby in the manger. The devil, remember, he is the father of lies. That's what he does. And there's many people at Christmas time, they will, in our wonderful city, they will just sleep right through next Sunday and will not know that Christmas is about the baby Emmanuel, who is God with us, who came into the world to die for our sins. But you do know him, verse 17, because he remains with you and will be in you. That phrase asking Jesus into your heart, that literally means that Christ, when you get saved, Christ sends his Holy Spirit into your heart so you can be saved. You know, I mentioned about what happens when someone who was saved, maybe as a teenager, and they all of a sudden, they don't go to church anymore. Well, that's a backslidden Christian if they were saved. Because I believe you might go through a period of time for maybe a few weeks, a few months, or even possibly a few years, but God speaks, gets a hold of his children. He convicts them of sin. He points out, hey, you're not living for me. You're not making godly decisions. And he brings them back to his his house. He brings them back into the fold, the sheep pen, as Jesus would say. So what happens for that man, that woman, who goes their whole life, who thinks they're saved, but they never come back? You know, the Bible tells us and teaches us. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 26, that there are many people who are going to stand before the Lord, and they say, Lord, Lord, look what I did for you. Look what I gave. Look at all my hard work. And Jesus says he will look at them and say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. I mean, there's a lot of people who think they're saved, and folks, the truth is they're not. They're just not saved. They do not know the Lord. And so what happens when someone falls away? They're either a backslidden Christian, and they need to repent and rededicate their life to Christ, just like Thomas did. He rededicated his life to Christ when Christ confronted him on his doubt, when he was falling backwards. He did not believe, but then he returned to his faith. And then the other way is there's many folks, they're just not saved. They do not know the Lord. And I think this morning, we want to look inside our lives and say, Lord, where do I stand with you? I see Joseph as the example. Joseph had made up his mind. He had set his heart what he believed. God spoke to him in his dream, and he woke up a different man. He was obedient and believed the Lord, and he acted on it. We take action on what God wants us to do. And some of us here this morning, God is speaking to you, and he wants you to, there, there, there's people you don't need to be talking to, there's things you need to repent of, there's, there's um, people you need to share the gospel with, there's just disobedience in your hearts, and the, and the Lord wants you to turn to him. And that's what we need to look at the example of Joseph and say, Lord, I'll do it. I want to be like Joseph. I'm going to open up. And Mary probably went to bed that night having no clue that, you know, down the hall, some other room down the hall or some other building, some other home, that her fiancé was going to divorce her. But then instead of divorcing her, he woke up and he says, Mary, I'm excited about our wedding. He woke up a different man. God meets us and confronts us, and immediately we can be changed. I'm going to invite our band to come forward right now. Y'all come on up here, Beecher. We're going to have our time of invitation. We're going to respond to God. Just like Joseph, we need to be obedient to the Lord.
we respond to God and we say, Lord, I'm going to do what you want me to do of what you're asking me. And when we do that, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit, he's, he comes inside of us and he guides us with every single step. But remember, Jesus says that does not occur unless we actually obey and follow his commands in John 14, 15. So we have a command from the Lord to be obedient and to follow him. So we're going to stand up. Our band's going to lead us in our song. I'm going to invite, I'm going to be standing up front. Zach Bauer's going to be standing up here with me. And I'm going to invite you to come. Say, I want to follow the Lord this morning. I want to join Broadway Baptist Church. I want to make a decision today to be like Joseph and be obedient to what God's called me to do. All right, be sure. Just as amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned. Worshiping with us uh, this morning. Uh, a couple quick announcements this uh, evening. We have service at six o'clock. I believe uh, David. We got choir, uh, Christmas choir uh, tonight at six o'clock. So hope you can make it out for that. That's always a uh, great, a uh, great service. Uh, this Wednesday we are off. No Wednesday services uh, this week or the following Wednesday as well. Uh, so if you come here, uh, you might have trouble getting in the doors. So, uh, And then, of course, our Christmas Eve service next Saturday at 5 o'clock. Uh, Christmas Eve candlelight service at 5 o'clock. And looks like you're going to want to wear your coat So, uh, <laughs> if you've seen the weather. so. Uh, and then uh, next Sunday morning, Christmas Day service at 10 a.m., one service next Sunday at 10 a.m. So uh, at this time, as we as we approach the season, remember uh, our, our giving, uh, year in giving, and, uh, just to the church and as well to our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, we hope that um, uh, you will uh, give to those uh, things. Let us pray and we will be dismissed. God, we give you praise and thanks uh, in this time and in this season, God, for your generosity, your goodness to us, uh, for sending your Son. Lord, may our hearts just uh, richly uh, reflect on, on how good you are and how merciful you are, Lord, in your love, God, that while we were sinners, you came uh, to die for us, Lord, 
Lord, I pray that we'll trust in you at all times when things are difficult, when there's things and circumstances we don't understand. Lord, that we will trust and look to you and know that uh, you are working in all those things and all those circumstances. Lord, as, uh, Lord, as we go about and, and may have many situations and trials and difficulties and pains in our lives and maybe in our families' lives, God, Lord, help us to, to look and trust in you and know that you are good and you comfort us. You are the one true comforter, God. Lord, may we go out with that message that it is Jesus alone who brings comfort and peace uh, to our hearts. Lord, that is the message of this season. And may we go out and proclaim it. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Sailing on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere go. Sailing on the mountain, 